I want to tell you about the time that I locked myself in the bedroom of my townhouse as these two guys were trying to break in. They were screaming, let, let us in! Trust us! And what's wrong with you? Later, I could hear them say, okay, we're leaving! And they went down the stairs, closed the front door, but they had not actually left. Scary. Actually, not at all. These were two of my closest college friends, and they were visiting me at my off-campus townhouse that night, and they, they, they discovered that night that I had never seen the movie The Shawshank Redemption. I still remember the look on their faces. One of my friends, who was like wonderfully impulsive, he says, I'm going to Blockbuster right now, and we are watching it two nights. Well, that seemed great, but I couldn't. I had a major paper that was due the next day, and I needed it to graduate. Now, I'll save you the play-by-play, -play, but they literally went to Blockbuster Video, they got the movie, and because, again, I needed to graduate, I locked myself in my room so I could finish this paper. Later, when they actually finally left, I made my way downstairs, and there was the videotape, the videotape with a note on it that said, you won't regret it. Also, this is due back by 9 p.m., if you don't know what Blockbuster Video was, ask someone above the age of 35 and ask them if, if they still have their Blockbuster card. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> I've saved it all these years for this sermon illustration. The next night, I, I watched The Shawshank Redemption by myself. And I was a bit bored at first, not really getting it. And just, you know, the, that first half was a little dense. And then it started to grow on me. And then I was completely mesmerized by the end. My friends were right. This was amazing. Almost worth failing class over, but thankfully it didn't come to that. Well, here's the 101. Andy Dufresne, played by Timothy Robbins, is wrongfully imprisoned for murder, and he has to serve two life sentences. In the movie, he meets a character named Red, played by Morgan Freeman, and they become the closest of friends. The entire cast, antagonists and all, are incredible. I won't ruin the ending for my friends under the age of 30, but I'll say this. Andy Dufresne eventually discovers that he is guilty. Not for murder, but for his selfishness. Which leads him to discovering his redemption. Ultimately, the Shawshank Redemption is a story about hope. Hope in the darkest of places. It's also a movie about surrender. Surrender is a major theme in our Lent series, Kingdom Come, Thy will be done. And I want us to look back on what we've covered in this series so far. In week one, Pastor John preached on Jesus' vulnerability in the Garden of Gethsemane and challenged us to examine our own vulnerability. In week two, Pastor Brian preached on surrendering our religious certainty. And we looked at the confrontations that Jesus would have with the Pharisees. Last week, we had Pastor Joshua Clough as our new senior pastor candidate preach on Jesus' most important commandment, to love God and to love others. And today we want to talk about surrendering our hope. So let's take a look in the text here. If you haven't noticed, part two of this Kingdom Come series is anchored in the last half of the Gospel of Mark. And because it's Passion Week or Holy Week, it's this last week of Jesus' earthly life. And so for our purposes, we see it as a week of surrender. Now to avoid confusion, surrender is not defeat. Surrender for our purposes is the choice to receive God's will for our lives. That's what Jesus models for us. So the chronological recap is that Jesus enters Jerusalem just before the Passover, right before the Passover on what we now call Palm Sunday. It's like the spontaneous parade where people throw their cloaks on the ground as, as Jesus enters the city on a donkey and the, the crowds are shouting, Hallelujah! Praise to the Son of David and all sorts of euphemisms for let's go, Jesus, let's go. From here, Jesus is going to clear out the temple of the corrupt money changers. He's going to confront the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Later, he will meet with the disciples for what's called the Last Supper. Then he'll be arrested in Gethsemane and then be sentenced to crucifixion. This message and this scene that we're going to look at takes place in the middle of all of that when Jesus is walking with his disciples in the temple courts that he just cleared out just a few days ago. And this is how it begins in Mark chapter 13. It says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Look, teacher, 
What massive stones, what magnificent buildings. What did Jesus say next? Well, let's place a multiple choice. A, yes indeed, our heavenly Father is worth even is worthy of even more of these massive stones and even more of these magnificent temples. Or B, while this is impressive, wait until you see the new houses of worship that we that will be built in my name. Or C, take a good look because the day is coming where this place is going to be destroyed. If this is my first time reading the Bible, I would have guessed option A. But the correct answer is actually more along the lines of C. Here's what he actually says. Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. What? Again, the context is, is Passion Week. Jesus last week before his crucifixion. And this may feel bizarre. So just let me give you a little bit of history here. The temple that the disciples are admiring is the centerpiece of their spiritual life. For the sake of argument, the disciples are probably saying this in hopes of coaxing their rabbi to say even more incredible things about the temple. Only Jesus doesn't. He rejects the idea of being a holy tour guide, and instead he moves to prophet Jesus. Now, if you understand this section of the Gospel of Mark and a major feature in this section of the Bible, you first have to understand just how important the temple is and its history. Over 1,000 years before Jesus and his disciples set foot here, King David is reigning over Israel. So in some ways, this story begins 1,000 years ago. That's, that's four times the age of our country. And so King David is reigning over Israel. It's an incredible time in Israel's history. And as he has defeated all of the nation's threats, fulfilling sets of promises that God has made to Abraham and the patriarchs and to David himself. As an age of peace is ushered in, King David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, which is symbolized as a dwelling place of Yahweh. And David wants to build a temple. But long story short, he discovers that that is not the Lord's will. And so he, and so he, he, he soars it elsewhere. Instead, God's desire is that David's son, King Solomon, builds the temple. And despite the fact that Solomon is a complicated figure in Scripture, he builds this beautiful temple. It's very impressive. And Solomon reigns over Israel's most prosperous and most peaceful era. Think of it as their golden age. Well, to keep things moving along here, I promise I'll connect the dots. Within a few generations of Solomon's reign, Israel is divided, attacked, and eventually it falls to Nebuchadnezzar's army in 586 BC. The city of Jerusalem is sacked. Countless are killed. The temple is destroyed. The Ark of the Covenant and the young citizens of Israel are taken back to Babylon to live in exile. It is the worst moment in ancient Israel's history. Seven years later, a bigger and badder army eventually takes over that part of the world. And so the Persian Empire becomes the world power. King Cyrus allows the Israelites to return to their home in Israel, rebuild Jerusalem and their temple. That's actually the story of Nehemiah, if you want to take a look. All this occurs about 500 years before the time of Jesus. Then, a few hundred years later, the Roman Empire takes the throne and puts everyone under Roman rule. It was said that Pompey entered the temple but did not plunder it. Later, Herod is given Israel to rule. You remember Herod from Christmas time, that, that, that King Herod. Herod is given Israel to rule Israel and he decides to renovate and build an amazing looking temple. And this renovation lasts about 40 years, and it was said to be beautiful. So beautiful that it almost takes away the disciples' breath as they walk with their rabbi Jesus through the courtyards. Look at how magnificent this is. And you would think Jesus would affirm this declaration, maybe validate it by adding, yes, such magnificence is honoring to our Heavenly Father, or point out something about the new temple, or teach them something about the original temple. But again, Jesus is not interested in being their tour guide. On this day, he's a prophet. Look at these massive stones. Look at these magnificent buildings. And to paraphrase, mark my words, all of this is going to become rubble. You won't be able to find two stones stacked on top of each other. The disciples are a bit stunned by this, and so they lean in. 
And Jesus goes for the, like the next 20 verses telling them about what wrath is coming to Israel. What does all this mean? It's a very complicated passage in the New Testament, and it will be explained to you next week when Pastor Brian preaches on the rest of Mark 13. So stay tuned for that. Today, we want to focus on the temple and what it represents. For the ancient Jewish audience, the temple was the center of religious life. It represented their source of salvation, where you brought your sacrifices in order to receive forgiveness for sin. It housed the religious system where the believers would worship and learn about their faith and their history as well. And this provided them with identity or status. It was also where the political rulers and religious leaders would give speeches and even hold trials, as we'll see later. The Temple of Jerusalem was the center of religious life for them, and it was magnificent. Well, today we need to talk about our temples, or our magnificent structures, our incredible systems, and even the impressive statuses that we've obtained. We have so many structures, like our sports stadiums. Some of you know I love baseball, and so I enjoy going to baseball parks like, like Fenway Park and Camden Yards. And of course, being a Yankees fan, I, I, I love taking my sons down to Yankee Stadium, and we have this opening day tradition that we do. Probably one of the most magnificent of the modern architecture places I've ever been in is the SoFi Stadium in, 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 in Los Angeles. It hosts the LA Rams and the LA Chargers and some of the biggest concerts. It's an amazing space. If you ever get a chance to go, you should go just, just to be in it. Recently, I got to visit the new Los Angeles Cathedral. Uh, personally, I don't get too caught up in a Catholic or Protestant space. It's a place of worship and prayer to the Lord, and I was so blessed to spend, to spend an hour in there. Now, we can probably think of many other magnificent structures. Historical monuments, majestic concert halls, state-of-the-art education facilities, Airports, like, like the Singapore airport, tech industry headquarters, all these places that make us feel, wow, this place is magnificent. My guess is that we could bore each other with the amazing buildings that are on our iPhone rolls. What's one of the most impressive places that you've been in? Well, let's think a little deeper. Jesus is not just talking about the physical structure of the temple, but also the system that it represented. To really feel what Jesus was saying here, imagine he came into the space and said, all of this is going to come crashing down. And I don't just mean the physical walls and the roof, and I don't just mean the Sunday system. I mean your entire religiosity, the complete way that you worship. All of it? Let's try negotiating with Jesus just a little bit. I mean, Jesus, I, I like a good bit of what you're saying. I agree that we need some changes. In fact, we've been working on a few ourselves over the years, and... And frankly, I, I could use a couple Sundays off. But Jesus, is it possible that you're overswinging here? I mean, do we really need to bring the whole thing crashing down? I mean, that feels excessive. To really understand what Jesus is saying, let's look at the Gospel of John, where he's in those same temple courts and is debating the Pharisees. And, and he says in John 2, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. To understand the Gospels of Mark and John, you have to understand that Jesus is saying that He is taking over the role of the temple. He's taking over the role that this magnificent temple serves. Instead of going to the temple for the forgiveness of your sins, we now go straight to the person of Jesus. It's easy to miss. And so I ask you, like the disciples, are we too impressed with our live structures and systems and the status that they bring to us? Does Jesus want us to see and find our hope elsewhere? The temple gave the ancient Jews a sense of security because it was where they, it was, where, it was the place where they believed that God had lived. The temple's incredible stature obviously impressed the disciples who were overwhelmed by the size of the stones and, and the grandeur of it and, and probably also its economic power. I mean, this is where stuff happens. And then Jesus helps them realize that there's something more. Do you see all these great buildings? When he tells them to look, he means more than just take another peek. To see, that word to see means to look with perception. 
He says, look at these buildings. See for what it is. Jesus invites him to see through the glitzy religiosity. See the temple's barrenness. See where it's just a space. To see the temple itself is not a, it's not just a, it's not a transcendent entity by itself, but it's a vehicle to see and experience the true glory of God and to experience God's love. What the disciples also do not know is that this is the same place that the same place they are marveling at is about to exert all its power to destroy their teacher. In fact, this week, Jesus is going to have his trial in a section of this temple by the Sanhedrin. Now we know that Jesus will have the final say. And yes, he will be found guilty by Pilate. He'll be sentenced to crucifixion. He will die. And then he'll be raised back to life on the third day, fulfilling his words. The, resur- the resurrected Jesus will be the new temple. And about 40 years after Jesus says these words, the powers of Rome will re-enter Jerusalem and they will level the city and destroy the temple. Again, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy here. I want us to take a moment and consider the word surrender at this point. Maybe you've already been convinced to live a life that desires to be surrendered to Jesus, but you're having difficulty with that daily surrender. And I want to encourage you on a a few practices here. One, I, I want to encourage you to audit your soul. Ask yourself, where is your joy? Where is your fear? Where is your hope? Am I putting my hope in structures or in systems? Am I hiding behind status? Do an audit of your soul. The second, I want to encourage you to grow in your understanding of surrender. And the way that you grow is by prayer. It is by spending time in Scripture. In this case, I'd also like to recommend fasting. What are you fighting for? What are you surrendering to? I know we don't like to think of ourselves as a surrendering people. I mean, we, we have a maxim of like no surrender, and, and that's fine. That's not the type of surrender I'm actually talking about. I'm not talking about surrendering because I've lost the fight. I'm talking about surrendering because I found my hope in Jesus. And third, I want to encourage you to find your joy in the Lord. Similar to your hope, similar to where your hope is found, often when we, when we find our joy, we also find our hope. Where is your joy found? Where is your hope found? As we often say, we have resources to help you avail- that are available on our Journey Discipleship resource page. But can I challenge you today? This type of surrender really comes with spiritual practice. So practice, so that you may find that ability to daily surrender. Just like Jesus said to his disciples, look, see, and realize. Is the Lord trying to show you something? I shared at our group leader gathering last week about the day that I learned that Pastor Brian was announcing that this was going to be his last year as our senior pastor. I've made mention in other spaces that I'm pursuing a doctorate of ministry on generational leadership at Floor Seminary. It it happens to be a very similar degree that our finalist for senior pastor candidate received. And I, I, I say that because I... I've been paying attention to things like succession and generational leadership. And so I knew that the time was coming at some point for Pastor Brian, but I honestly did not expect the timing of it being last year into this year. I also knew that Brian wanted to leave before folks started to speculate when he should leave. And so when he shared in that room I was in, my first thought was genuine happiness for him. He was going to leave on his own terms and on his own timeline, of course, in collaboration with the Board of Elders. But I was happy for him and for Karen. And yet the next morning when I woke up, I couldn't help but feel some kind of loss that I I hadn't figured out what it was. Our mornings are filled with four kids and two working parents that are trying to get out the door, so they're pretty full and fast. So it wasn't until after I got the last one off to school that I was able to sit down for a second. And I had this, this nagging feeling, similar to when I would hear of a loss of someone that I wasn't particularly close to, but I still felt something. I wasn't sure what that loss was yet. And then it hit me. While I was genuinely happy for Brian and for Karen, I was starting to grieve that a good thing was coming to an end. Then it also hit me. And that was good. Later, this would allow me to believe that more good things were in store for us as a church, 
and as we serve the kingdom of God. I share this because chances are you might have a similar experience and mixed feelings with the news of all this. It's a big transition. And it's a very important time in our church. And I am genuinely excited and hopeful for what God has in store for us. So I want to lean into this for just for a few minutes. And as an attempt to lighten the mood here a little bit, some of you are wondering what Brian might be doing next. Uh, none, that are, none of what I'm about to say is actually true, but I hope it's fun. Uh, as you know, Brian loves many things. He loves Jesus. He loves Karen and his wonderful children and grandchildren. He loves running. He loves ice cream. He loves the New York Yankees and the Giants. But Brian also loves meetings for some reason. I mean, he, he literally calls himself a meeting junkie. That's probably the only true part that I'm going to say in this section. He, he literally calls himself a meeting junkie. And so he's launching this new endeavor, similar to Uber Eats, where if you need someone to fill in for you at a work meeting, Brian will sit in for you. He loves meetings. After four decades of preaching, he's, it has allowed him to learn about all the various sectors and careers. And as, as he's told us on numerous occasions, I know just enough to be dangerous. And so right now he's at work developing, developing an app. And so you'll just enter the time and the, supply, and the, time and the place. You'll submit your payment and he'll show up ready to go. He's calling it Wilker Meetings. Meetings with a Y. Well, even in recent meetings, Brian has sometimes given the best insights or ideas in that meeting. And often they make me wonder, what are we going to do without him? I suspect that he quietly wonders the same. Oh boy, what are they going to do without me? Well, I counted them up. I, I probably have spent about 5,000 hours of meetings with Brian over the year since I started on staff in 2011. 5,000 hours, give or take. And some of the lessons I've learned from Brian in these meetings is, is this. One of them is God will always provide. That's who he is. We see it all throughout scripture. God is a provider. I hear Brian saying that all the time. God will provide. Years ago, I remember Brian saying he doesn't really save any sermon illustrations. If the Lord brings an illustration that, that serves his big idea for that week's sermon, he almost always uses it that week. But that's an amazing illustration. You might say that for Easter. Yes, but God will provide another one for when you need it. You can apply this truth to just about anything. And I believe that the Lord has provided a successor in Joshua as our next senior pastor. As a member of the 12-person search committee and, and as one who happens to be the preacher in between the weeks, this feels like a providential moment to speak into this. I want to tell you, without exception, the entire search committee was filled with truly remarkable people. It was an impressive room of thoughtful, talented, spirit-led people who have an extraordinary love for this church. There was also a lot of passion in that room. To the point that I wondered, how are we going to ever really agree on anyone? And is this going to get ugly? Just like how no one wants to be the captain of a ship that goes down, no one wants to be on the committee that finds the wrong person. Early in the fall, I, I found myself losing sleep over this, literally. Now, what if we get this wrong? What if we get charmed by the person and that they end up being a terrible fit? I even wondered, how can I get out of this? Is it too late? And then fellow committee member and friend Owen Knight verbalized my thoughts one night when he candidly shared that he had a sleepless night tossing and turning and wrestling in prayer with the Lord. And just about everyone in our Zoom room exclaimed all at once, I've been losing sleep too. Over the months, over the hours of interviews and the debriefings and listening to so many sermons and having all these follow-up conversations, and having a church full of people like yourself praying, you could feel the Lord helping us, bringing clarity and perspective. And to make a long story short, 12 people found themselves agreeing on one person. No big persuasive speeches, no big fights, no chair throwing, but through prayer, not only our own, but again, an entire church praying, and the Spirit's leading, we unanimously decided on Joshua. And later I found myself sleeping just fine. And here's a bit of the why. In the hours of conversation, we believe that Joshua was being prepared to lead as a senior pastor. From his church planting experience to serving in one of the larger congregations in the country, 
to his doctorate work on adaptive leadership and more, it was clear that the Lord was preparing him. But what made him stand out for us were two things. One was his poise in our interviews. It was clear that, that he spent a considerable amount of time in between interviews learning more about Grace Chapel, predicting our questions and, and how he might answer them, and preparing his heart for the moment. Which led to the second. Though we were impressed by his talent, we were even more impressed by his humility and his self-awareness. Pastor Mark McDonald would, would say, he's really great at interviews, but are we going to want to be with him when we're in the room with him? And when he came to visit, oh, absolutely. A really just down-to-earth individual. There's more to say here, but we, we agreed that this was the leader we wanted to be, that we wanted to have for the next senior pastor of our church. This message is about surrendering our hope to what the Lord has done for us. And it has multiple applications. There's the hope for our salvation, the hope of how we live each day, which we'll come back to in a second. But I also believe there's an opportunity for us as a church to surrender to what the Lord has prepared for us. I believe it's also an opportunity of surrender for Joshua and for Claire and Ada, as much as it is for Grace Chapel. As one of the pastors here at Grace, it's it's my personal hope that each of you prayerfully discern this moment because it feels like a God-given provision for Grace Chapel today. I invite you to reflect on what surrendering your hope to Jesus means as you journey throughout Lent. Like the disciples, have we become too impressed with our structures and our systems and our statuses of life? I want to encourage you instead, may we surrender our hope to Jesus, our magnificent Savior. May we be reminded by the teaching of Jesus. May we be reminded all these structures are going to be destroyed. And so may we revolve our lives around Christ, the new center, the new temple, our Lord, so that we may say, Lord, thy will be done. If I can close with a line from Shawshank Redemption, is Andy Dufresne saying, remember, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're so thankful for all the things that you are at work doing right now. And while we are thankful for pop culture movies and and really great stories, we are even more thankful for your scriptures. Thank thank you, Lord, for allowing us to, to put ourselves right there in the temple courts with you and your disciples, calling us to look and to see that all this is all these earthly things are going to be leveled and become rubble one day. And help us, Lord, then to to surrender our hope and to fix our gaze upon you. Help us to do this daily, to have a daily surrender to you. And so may you lead us, Lord, as individuals, and may you lead us as a church into this new season ahead. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.